Uh, welcome everybody to our December Lofty webinar. I'm Sarah McAllister. I host these with Sam Manzello and Sayaka Suzuki. Uh, just a reminder for everybody to keep themselves on mute uh, during the webinar and we'll get to the questions at the end, um, usually through the chat box. So go ahead and type questions in whenever you have them and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so our speaker today is Professor Jason Sharples. Um, and I have a little intro here for him. I just need to reopen it on my phone. Uh, he is a mathematical scientist and internationally recognized expert in dynamic bushfire behavior and extreme bushfire development. He has led several Australian Research Council and Bushfire National Hazard Cooperative Research Center projects and is involved in international wildfire research projects. These projects considered various aspects of extreme and dynamic bushfire propagation, the development of large conflagrations and bushfire risk management. His expertise is particularly relevant because of the large gap between the predictions of current mathematical models of fire behavior and actual fire behavior, and because of the increasing prevalence of extreme wildfires due to climate change. Jason has acted as an expert witness at various coronal, uh, coronial and independent bushfire inquiries and at the 2020 Royal Commission into the National, Nation, National Natural Disaster Arrangements. He is a key contributor to the international dialogue around wildland fire modeling and risk management, and his research has also been adopted in national firefighter training materials and into the operational procedures of bushfire management agencies, such as the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. He's also a, a volunteer firefighter with the ACT Rural Fire Service since 2003. So without further ado, uh, Jason, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I should point out I'm kind of more of a elapsed volunteer these days as uh, I don't really get the time to dedicate that to as, as, as much as I'd like to. But anyway, yeah, thanks, thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the introduction and, and the opportunity to come and talk to you today. What I basically want to try and do is, I guess, touch on various aspects of the research we've been doing over the last 10 years or so, and really try and highlight the importance of understanding fire dynamics uh, and the role they play in development of these large fires, like the one that you can sort of see on the screen there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out just by, I guess, defining the problem a little bit, trying to give you a bit more of an idea of what I'm talking about when I, when I um, yeah, mention an extreme wildfire. We'll get this thing to work. There we go. All right. So Two photos there. Um, both um, show some pretty nasty um, fire behavior going on. Although I, I really want to try and just focus on the differences in, in these photos for the moment. So if you look at the one on, on the left there, um, you can see um, the photographer standing, you know, maybe a few hundred meters away from the fire to take the photo. Um, this is the South Canyon fire, which I suspect most people are aware of. Um, killed 14 uh, firefighters back in 1994. Grew to a, a total area of about 900 hectares, so a, a large fire, but um, you know, nothing, nothing really spectacular in terms of its size. But what you can see there is you know, quite um, intense fire behavior going on. And really, when you look at something like that, it fits the the definition that you see in the National Wildland uh, Wildfire Coordinating Group glossary of a blow up. Okay, so here the a blow up is defined as a sudden increase in fire line intensity or rate of spread, often accompanied by violent uh, convection. I've added in the, the pyro convection there and other firestorm characteristics. Okay, so what's a firestorm? Well, again, if we refer to the um, the glossary, a firestorm is really probably something more like we see in the picture on the right. Okay, so again, note the differences. Um, the photographer is now standing several tens of kilometers away from the fire to get it all into the, um, into the frame. And you can see that the fire doesn't actually, you know, well, you can still see the smoke there, but it's also taken on these sort of characteristics of an atmospheric storm, okay? And this is actually a, a pyroaccumulonimbus in you know, the uh, force at Denali fire back in 2013 down in Tasmania. Order of magnitude, um, or two orders of magnitude, um, roughly bigger um, in area, ultimately. And you know, this this thing wasn't just killing firefighters; it was destroying whole townships. So, the thing on the left there we can think of as a blow up. 
the thing on the right, we're really talking about something more like the uh, the definition of a firestorm in the glossary. Okay, so firestorm, again, violent pyroconvection, but this time we're attaching it to a, a large continuous area of intense fire. And we're starting to talk about some of the atmospheric um, characteristic it takes on, like violently destructive um, surface winds. Okay, so the, the problem that, that we kind of have in Australia, and I'm not sure if it's the same around other parts of the world, but the term firestorm has kind of been hijacked by the media. And you know, according to the media now, anything with flames higher than about four meters um, in, in flame length qualifies of, as a firestorm. So really to try and, I guess, focus the, uh, the science a little bit better, back in 2016, we, we had a go of, of coming up with a, a kind of a, a more focused definition. Um, trying to keep the main sort of ideas that were in that definition of a firestorm from the glossary that we saw on the last screen, but also trying to bring in some of the other things which weren't, um, I guess, highlighted or, or emphasized as much as, as they probably should be. So about five years or, or so ago, we, we wrote a paper where we defined an extreme wildfire, which was an extreme bushfire in that paper, but I'll use the more internationally accepted term. So an extreme wildfire is a fire that exhibits the deeper widespread flaming. So that's that large continuous area of intense flame. But we added the, uh, the other sort of caveat here that we really need this to be taking place in an atmospheric environment conducive to the development of pyroconvection. Okay, and in particular, we were sort of focusing then on storm, on, on fires which developed into these sort of towering pyrocumulus or pyrocumulonimbus storms. Okay, like the, like the Fawcett Donnelly fire that I showed. So I guess the, the key thing that we're really trying to draw out is thinking about things these ways, this way, is that when we're talking about these extreme wildfires, we're really talking about fires that exhibit a significant degree of coupling between the fire and the atmosphere. Okay, so this is extending well above the mix layer. And this coupling also acts to modify or maintain the fire's propagation. Okay, so it can do this through um, you know, processes like the erratic winds that are, that are caused through the uh, the indraft and other, other things going on with the plume. Um, mass spotting is a big one. And then you also have things like um, pyrogenic lightning coming out of the pyro CB. Just a few things to note. Um, extreme wildfires will generally comprise one or more, one or more blow up fire events. Okay, so that's contributing to the, the, the deep widespread, though large continuous area of flame. But not all blow up fire events are gonna develop into extreme wildfires. So the South Kenyan fire, for example, didn't really register as an extreme wildfire, even though it was a very serious event, obviously. The other thing to note is that um, there's a lot of talk about megafires these days. Um, I'd like to sort of you know, think of megafires as being distinct from extreme wildfires. Um, megafires really are defined by their ultimate extent and the large commitment of resources that are required over long periods of time to, to bring them under control. Um, extreme wildfires, we're really talking about something different. And really, if you think about it, extreme wildfires, as I've defined them there, and megafires aren't really related beyond the fact that some megafires will exhibit extreme wildfire characteristics on an episode, episodic basis you know, at, at you know, different points around its large perimeter. And um, you know, these episodes of extreme wildfire are often going to be the ones which give you the, uh, the most impacts that you get from a megafire. Okay, so much of the significant impact of a megafire will actually occur during um, these episodes of extreme wildfire behavior where you get you know, high intensity, you know, lots of spotting, house loss, and all the rest. Okay, so that's just a little bit to, to set the scene. Um, the, the reason we sort of gravitated towards this definition was because it sort of pulls out those two aspects of the problem that are highlighted in blue there. There's deeper widespread flaming and the atmosphere has got to be doing the right sort of thing. So when we sort of think about the definition like that, then if we want to try and think about what causes an extreme wildfire, we can really break that down into two bits. So trying to understand how we get an extreme wildfire, we really need to understand how we um, get this deep, widespread flaming and we also need to address the problem of how do we know when the atmosphere is conducive to the development of violent pyroconvection and even though we consider these two things as, as two separate parts what we really need to do 
is we need to try and figure out how these two different aspects of the phenomenon actually go together. Okay, so what's the right balance for the amount of, or the, the depth of flaming you need if the atmosphere is you know, only marginally um, conducive to, to thunderstorm formation, for example? What's, what's the right balance between these two aspects? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but um, what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna start with the atmospheric part of it first, because that's kind of where we've approached the problem um, historically. So if we think about the way people have thought about trying to understand and predict these sorts of extreme wildfire events, a lot of the work, probably all of the work has, has been couched in terms of these atmospheric drivers, okay? So two, different aspects of the atmosphere have been looked at, the surface conditions, okay? And these are basically characterized as, you know, if it's hot, dry and windy, then we're gonna have conditions more likely to, to produce these sorts of wildfires. So that's reflected in things like the, the forest fire danger index that we have in Australia, the Canadian fire weather index, and even more recent developments like the, the hot, dry, windy index of uh, Strocket Howe, which is wind speed divided by the vapor pressure deficit. Okay, within a within a 500 meter layer above the surface. Um, we also have sort of lower to mid level atmospheric conditions that are accounted for through things like the Haynes index. In Australia, we now use the C Haynes index, um, which is just a kind of an extended version of the Haynes index. We have things like CAPE and then uh, fire CAPE, and even more recent things like the, uh, the Pyro CB firepower threshold of uh, Tori and Keppert. The interesting thing though is that Despite the fact that, you know, as, as the definition was, was really trying to highlight, if, despite the fact that extreme wildfires are coupled fire atmosphere events, much of the focus has been on the atmospheric side and much less attention is being paid to the role of the dynamics of the fire. And what I want to do now is just, I guess, highlight a few examples of why um, it's important to actually also consider the dynamics of the fire. So I'm going to look at some of these, these atmospheric measures and I guess um, highlight some of the limitations. All right, so this is a, a study we did a couple of years ago uh, with some colleagues in the Climate Change Research Centre up in uh, University of New South Wales in Sydney. So what we did in this study was we got a whole bunch of different fires uh, between 1990 and 2016 over southeastern Australia. So some of these fires um, were confirmed as producing pyrocumulonimbus events, pyrocbs, and some of them didn't produce pyrocbs. Okay, so we're trying to understand, you know, what were the, or what, was there a way to discriminate the conditions which produce pyrocbs compared to non-pyrocbs? Okay, so 40 pyrocbs in the data set, and then 166 non-pyrocbs or, or standard wildfires, we call them. What we can see in these two graphs, um, up on the top, we've got the distribution of the forest fire danger index. So this is just looking at the surface fire weather. And the top one is showing you the distribution of the different fire danger rating categories um, for all the pyro CBs that we had. And then to contrast on the bottom, we've got the same distribution of fire danger conditions for the non pyro CB fires. And so you can see while there's, you know, there's a few more um, fires ending up in the catastrophic and extreme um, cases and, and severe, we've still got this big overlap where most of our pyro CB fires are occurring in the very high category. And similarly, you know, the non pyro CBs are, are sort of registering in the very high category, okay, a little bit more representation down here, but it doesn't really show a clear discrimination between um, pyro CB and non pyro CB events in terms of the uh, there's just the surface weather. Okay, so that sort of gives you a little bit of guidance, but you know, doesn't discriminate it that that well. What about if we look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the low to mid level atmospheric conditions through the C. Haynes? Okay, well, there's the C. Haynes distribution for pyro CBs. Okay, now you think, okay, well, this is this is looking a lot better. Um, the pyro CBs only occurred when the C. Haynes was above about seven or eight. And this has been, been confirmed in lots of different studies actually as you know, seven or eight as being a, a sort of a threshold for, for more dangerous conditions. The problem though, is when you look at the non pyro CB distribution, then there's a hell of a lot of non pyro CBs 
okay? In fact, about 50% of them, which occur into that C. Haynes bigger than about seven or eight category as well. Okay, so again, while it sort of suggests that C. Haynes being above seven or eight is a, uh, I guess, a, a necessary condition for pyro-CB formation, it's definitely not sufficient. Okay, we have 50% of our non-pyro-CB fires occurring under these conditions. So again, not really good um, or not all that useful uh, you know, on a given day when you've got a bunch of fires trying to figure out which ones are going to turn into pyro-CBs. Just looking at the surface fire weather or the C. Haynes in isolation doesn't give you a great amount of discrimination in deciding which ones are going to, to you know, turn into pyro-CBs. Um, we sort of followed this kind of idea up uh, more recently following our, oh, actually, I'll, I'll just touch on this. This is an important graph. So this is, this is, these are the same data, okay? So this is our, our 40 pyro-CBs. They're the white ones in that plot, and the red ones are the 166 standard wildfires. But there's a lot going on in this graph, so I'll just explain. So the themed, color-themed um, sort of layer you can see underneath there, is telling you how um, frequent conditions are with a given C. Haynes and a given forest fire danger index. So you can see the most common conditions are down here with low C. Haynes and low FFTI, not surprising. Then you have this kind of, um, sort of line coming out here where all your um, conditions are focused mainly. Okay, so very common getting up to less common and then very uncommon in, in dark blue. And you can see that a lot of their fire events are sort of sort of clustered around this, this little uh, ridge of um, probability. But then there's these few outlier events here. Okay, so the other things going on here, are you have the shape of the point. The shape of the point indicates what sort of terrain it is. And then you have the color of the uh, boundary of the point, which indicates, I guess, what sort of fuel you're in. Um, and basically we're looking at two different fuel classes eucalypt forest or, or woodland, and then your more mallee um, shrubland, grassland type thing. So the interesting thing is even though you've sort of got this broad mix of pyro CBs and non-pyro CBs all sort of occurring in the same region of this, this sort of uh, phase plane, the interesting thing is that all the pyro CBs or the majority of the pyro CBs tend to be crosses and triangles and with green borders, okay? A few exceptions here and there, but for the most part, you're only getting pyro CBs um, when you're in rolling hills or steep mountains. Okay, so what this is really starting to suggest to us is that you've got this um, terrain element coming in. Moreover, you're really only getting pyro CBs with green borders, okay? So more in the forest field types. Okay, so this really suggests that it's not just about the weather. There is a role of fuel and terrain going on here. And the fact that you've got fuel and terrain involved really brings us back to the fire behavioral um, dimension of the problem. Okay, so pyro CBs are occurring predominantly in rugged landscapes and in forest fuels. And again, this is sort of pointing us back to the ground saying well, what the fire is doing, the sort of fire behaviors that you get in those sorts of environments are playing a part in these, in these events. All right, so now I'll um, go on to the, the next slide I was going to talk about before. So I think most people are aware our 2019-2020 season was particularly bad in Southeast Australia. We refer to it as the black summer. Um, previously, we would, would refer to only single days as, as black, like Black Saturday or Black Friday. Uh, this time we, in, we refer to the whole season as black. Um, if we just restrict our focus to New South Wales, um, we had 29 pyro CB, pyro CB events recorded over 11 days. And what we did in this little sort of preliminary study that we looked at was just saying, what, what were the sort of broad weather patterns doing on the days when we were getting these pyro CBs compared to the days where we weren't? Okay, so you can see one of the pyro CBs here actually in the satellite image. And what I've done is I've taken conditions at Canberra Airport to be sort of broadly um, representative of the MS, air mass um, upwind of where these, these pyro CBs were occurring. Okay, so if we look at the conditions of Canberra Airport, then we can start to look at something like the hot, dry, windy index. Okay, 
So what we're looking at in this graph is we've got the red bars giving you the piracy B count on different days. Okay, so you can see here that on this day, it was uh, particularly bad. We had seven piracy B events in the one day. Um, and then we had days where we didn't have any piracy B events. The blue trace here is looking at the maximum hot, dry, windy. I should point out only calculated using surface conditions, but um, I think it's, it's you know, that's, that's not too rough a measure. Um, but what you can see from this is that for piracy bees to occur, you're really looking at a threshold of hot, dry, windy being greater than about 450, which is this uh, black line going across here. However, that's not really that great of a discriminator because 54% of the day satisfied hot, dry, windy bigger than 450, and that gave us a false positive rate of about 45%. Okay, so about 50-50 in terms of determining whether we got a piracy B or not. Okay, so that's kind of looking at the, the atmospheric component of, of, the, of the phenomenon. If we bring ourselves back again to the fire behavioral um, component of the problem by looking at something like fuel moisture, this is the fuel moisture index, basically difference between temperature and relative humidity, then what you find is you get better discrimination of the, of the days where you were getting pyro Bs. Okay, so now we're only getting pyro Bs on days where the fuel moisture index was less than six, but now there's a smaller proportion of days that satisfy that condition. And correspondingly, you've got a smaller false positive rate. Okay, so looking at something like fuel moisture, actually discriminates the conditions uh, for pyrocivies better than, than something like the hot, dry, windy index. And again, as I said, this really brings us back to thinking about the fire behavior because an FMI less than six corresponds to a, an actual fuel moisture content in eucalypt litter of you know, around about 5%, which is critically low. And these are the sorts of fuel moisture conditions that are associated with things like really high intensity fire, and in particular, profuse spotting. Okay, and profuse spotting as we'll, we'll see in a minute, is one of the things which can produce these, these widespread regions of active flame. Um, just as a, a quick aside, if we look at combining the effects or the, the influence of the, uh, the atmosphere and the fire behavior through something like fuel moisture index, and all I've done here is I've just divided the sea hanes by the, by the fuel moisture index, um, then we actually get far better discrimination of the, of the conditions um, on you know, where we got pyro CVs. Okay, so if I just have this new index P for pyro CB, and we can see that we only got pyro CVs on days where P was bigger than two, we've got a much lower um, proportion of days again, this time 16% of days satisfied this condition and only a false positive rate of about 7%. So this is kind of interesting because C. Haynes and FMI are sort of looking at two different aspects of the problem. C. Haynes is at that low to mid-level atmospheric component. FMI is talking about the fuel moisture, which links you to fire behavior. And so by combining information, which is relevant to the atmospheric conditions and the fire behavior potential, we're actually getting better discrimination of, of these, these sorts of events, okay? And again, is this really surprising? Probably not, because these things are coupled fire atmosphere events. All right, so I'll just come back to this definition and sort of talked about the atmospheric component, I guess. Uh, what I want to do now is really focus on the other aspect of it, which is the uh, fire behavioral part. So we've got this bit in the definition here, which says an extreme wildfire exhibits deep or widespread flaming. This is this large area of continuous, continuous flaming. What do I mean by deep flaming? Well, I've just got a couple of little cartoons here just to illustrate the concepts. Um, if you think about an, an ordinary wildfire, um, you can think about it as a, as a flame front, which uh, delineates the unburnt ground ahead of the fire and the burnt ground behind the fire. And you know, usually this flame front is something of the order of you know, maybe tens of meters at, at the most you know, in ordinary situations. Deep flaming on the other hand, we want to really think about something like this. So we've got much larger flame depth, you know, hundreds of meters. We've got discontiguous fire line, okay, with lots of spot fires going on. These are all interacting with each other, coalescing, producing large regions of flame. Okay, so that's this is what I'm sort of getting at when I talk about deep flaming. 
why is deep flaming important when it comes to extreme wildfire development? Well, we had a, a bit of a, a go at looking into this using some idealized uh, modeling. So what we're seeing here is we've got plumes basically coming from fires of different radius. So 150 meter circular fire. And when I say fire, we're really just talking about a, a hot piece of land, a surface heat flux coming from 150 meter radius uh, here in panel A. Panel B, we've got a 500 meter radius. Panel C is a one kilometer radius and then panel D is a four kilometer radius. Okay, so really big area of heat and, and relatively small area of heat. And what you can see is that the size of the fire, and they're, they're all equal intensity, I should say, the size of the fire, you know, unsurprisingly, affects how high the plume will go. Okay, so that's, that's not all that surprising. And I'll just include this picture here of the Creek Fire from 2020, just to show that even though we were using very idealized models, the sort of results we're getting you know, do kind of resemble real events. Okay, so it's not surprising that a bigger fire, bigger area fire is gonna give you a higher plume. What is more surprising is that it's also the shape of the fire, which is important. Okay, and we can see that in these uh, simulations here, which I'll, I'll just talk about before I let them run. So here over on the, uh, the leftmost column, we've got a fire, which is the shape of a circle of one kilometer radius. Okay, the middle column, we've got another fire, this time it's shaped like a rectangle. And over on the right, another rectangular fire, but we've, we've smeared it out. So it looks more like a fire front than a region of deep flaming, if you like. The uh, different rows are gonna be different wind speeds. So no wind at the top, five meter per second wind in the middle and a 10 meter per, se 10 meter per second wind along the bottom. Important to note, all the fires have the same area, okay? All we've done is we've redistributed that area into different shapes. All fires have the same intensity and therefore they have the same total power output. So the only real difference here is the shape of the fire, the geometry. Okay, so I can press play, it spins up for a while, and then you can see the different um, plume behaviors. Okay, so if you're just looking across that top row, you can see even though these fires have exactly the same area and intensity and therefore the same power, your big circular fire is shooting straight up into the stratosphere. Okay, the tropopause is this, this dotted line going across. The more rectangular fire, the ratio of four to one length to breadth is, is getting up high, but it's not hitting the stratosphere. And then our really smeared out uh, ordinary fire front, 64 to one ratio is, isn't getting as high. Okay, and this relationship persists when we look at the five meter per second wind case and starts to lose its, its signal, I guess, when you, when you get down to the 10 meter per second wind case. Okay, I can just let those run again from people's interest. So the real point of this is that the geometry and the spatial expanse of the flaming zone make, make a difference, okay? Um, and the reason we think this is, is because when you have a really broad plume being produced from something like a, a big fat circle compared to a, a skinny uh, fire line, which is gonna give you a, a you know, fairly thin sheet of a plume, your broad plume is gonna be less susceptible to entrainment and dilution with increasing altitude, and therefore it's able to punch higher up into the atmosphere. It's able to couple more with the atmosphere and so on. I should credit my um, postdoc, Rachel Badlin, who, who did all the work here. Um, so we can just summarize these, these, um, this analysis in a little bit more detail here. So the geometries we're looking at were the, the circle, a rectangle of four to one ratio and a 64 to one ratio. We did look at some other different shapes and, and you know, rectangles in between. And these are basically the results we got. So maximum plume height on the Y axis. On the X axis, we've got something called the logarithm of the isoparametric ratio. So the isoparametric ratio is giving you a, an idea of the, the, the perimeter to area ratio. Okay, so something like a smeared out rectangle has a high isoparametric ratio. A square, uh, a circle has the lowest isoparametric ratio. Okay, so you can see as our isoparametric ratio increases, the maximum plume height decreases. 
and we can start to add wind to that. So that's a seven kilometer per hour wind, pretty much the same sort of result. 14 kilometer, same sort of result. 22 kilometer starting to smooth things out a bit. And this is as the fires becoming more wind dominated. Okay, 29 and then 36, okay. But you can see even for the 22 uh, kilometer per hour wind, our big fat circle was actually getting above the tropopause in terms of its maximum plume height. The fires here are all 100 kilowatts per meter squared, which is you know, in the ballpark of um, fire intensities that have been measured in, in actual fires. You know, for example, 87 kilowatts per square meter uh, from the Rowan and Clements' study. Okay, so these geometries here, which represent um, more of your deep flaming situation, punch higher than your geometries, which represent the more typical or traditional frontal fire spread. Um, the other thing we haven't really accounted for in these simulations is that when you have things like mass spotting events, igniting large areas of land, they're not all these individual spot fires aren't acting in isolation, okay? They will interact with each other. And this has an effect on the amount of firepower that's being put out, at least in, in the peak, uh, in, in terms of its peak intensity. So what we're seeing here is basically a very simple model um, of fire spread, it's, um, the spark model, those people are familiar with um, that perhaps. All we've done is we've lit a bunch of spot fires and this just shows the progression of the fires at two different points in time. So you can see there's no wind. These things are just sort of growing as circles, completely unaware of each other, and eventually merge, merge into each other. So this is, with our, this, is, this is our model with pyroconvective interactions turned off, but we can also turn them on. And when we turn them on, we actually get quite a different um, result. You can see here now all these fires are starting to draw each other in. They're interacting with each other, and you've got faster rates of spread due to that, and hence higher intensities. If you add up the intensity over time and over all that, that area, then what you find is you get some interesting differences. Okay, so this is with five spots, 25 spots, 50 spots, and 100 spots. Okay, so what we can see here is that as we start to add more spot fires into that area, the interaction between them really starts to produce a noticeably higher peak. Uh, firepower okay and then again this has implications for how high the associated plume is going to punch into the sky and so on and how rapidly it's going to ascend okay so that's um, just work we did um, with our colleagues at the uh, CSRO data 61 James Hilton in particular who's done a lot of the uh, development of the spark model if people are interested in following that up um, what I really wanted to just finish up with though was um, I've talked about the importance of deep flaming. Um, what then triggers deep flaming? Okay, that was one of the key questions we, we posed at the start. So what I've got here is a list of events that we have identified which can contribute to deep flaming. Now, some of these are pretty well known, strong winds and a wind change, but then there's a bunch here which may not be that um, well known or, or understood, in particular because these last four here actually involve dynamic um, fire behaviour. Okay, so dynamic fire behavior, I mean fire behavior, which is influenced between feedbacks between the fire and the environment. And they're also subject to things like uh, environmental thresholds. These aren't actually independent. Okay, so a lot of these will, will sort of, you know, the borders between them will be blurred. Um, I won't go into that today. The two I really want to focus on today are this thing called vorticity driven lateral spread and its relation to mass spotting and fire coalescence, which I've, which I've already mentioned in passing. The other thing to note about these sorts of fire behaviors, the dynamic ones, is that currently we don't really have very good operational capacity to, to predict these sorts of things. Okay, and we're, we're working on that as, yeah, as we speak. All right, so vorticity driven lateral spread, what is it? Well, it's this weird thing where on the lee slope of a, uh, of a hill, which is sufficiently steep and, and kind of facing the right way. If you have a fire there, then it can actually do some weird things. So over on the uh, left here, we've got footy, uh, still from a um, laboratory experiment. Fire started about here. It spreads back up the ridge against the wind. So the wind's coming out of the page here. 
then when it gets to the ridge, it does this very pronounced um, and rapid lateral spread across the top of the ridge. You can see exactly the same thing happening here in a uh, coupled fire atmosphere simulation. Okay, so this has the effect of broadening the fire in the lateral direction uh, quite considerably. The other thing which it does, which you can't see here, is that in a real fire, these regions of lateral spread actually become pretty good generators of, of embers and you end up with spotting downwind of these things. And then that's when you have this, this deep flaming forming. Um, this is again model output, but just showing you what the wind is doing. So what's actually happening here is you've got sort of ambient horizontal vorticity flowing over the ridge. And then when your fire gets involved in that, it tilts it and stretches the plumes until you get these counter-rotating vortices. Okay, it's these counter-rotating vortices which then carry the fire across, across the top of the ridge. And you can see it here in a, a recent example of a fire in, in Montana. And you can see the, uh, the rotation on that, that flank coming from the lee slope. Uh, next. Okay, and here's, here's a, another example from our Black Summer in Australia. And you can see you've got a lee slope here, the fires moved across it um, through the influence of uh, vorticity driven lateral spread. But you can see the, the area downwind from that lateral spread zone is just full of embers. Okay, and you can sort of see all these, these embers forming, um, dropping, igniting fires, and all these fires are then merging with each other, interacting with each other increasing the intensity of the fire, increasing the depth of the flaming zone. Um, this is a nice little example which shows you how rapidly uh, vorticity driven lateral spread can escalate the, a fire in terms of its size and intensity. So this is um, a line scan of a fire in, in New South Wales at about 20 past one in the afternoon. And you can see you've got a, a fire burning over here and another little fire has, has started here. We won't go into how that started. Um, this fire here exhibiting normal sort of uh, frontal fire behavior, okay, fairly thin burning region and burnt stuff behind it. This one here is doing something a little bit more interesting. So that's at 20 past one. This is what it looked like about 50 minutes later, um, 50 minutes to an hour later. So you can see what's happened is you've got this little fire here, which I can highlight in both things by that little white ellipse. Um, despite the fact that the wind was coming out of the Northwest, the fire has actually propagated to the Southwest, okay, almost 90 degrees at odds with the wind. And then has spilled out and you can see the depth of the flame here with the, the sensor saturating over a, a pretty large area. This fire still, you know, exuding pretty ordinary frontal behavior, although this is making a bit of a run up here, you can see. Interesting thing is though, to think about how this um, aligns with the terrain. And what I've got there in the white and red lines is just the, the ridge lines. And so you can see this, this lateral spread has been um, you know, anchored to those, those ridge lines. So this is a pretty clear indication that this is being driven by, uh, by VLS, or history driven lateral spread. Okay, so within an hour, it's actually spread about one and a half kilometres um, to the southeast across the wind. That, that rate of spread would be fairly quick for, for a fire moving downwind, let alone across the wind. But then it's basically spilled out as a massive spot fires about four kilometres downwind as well from that lateral spread zone. Okay, so this, this means that our fire has actually grown by about 500 hectares in, in less than an hour. Which is pretty pretty impressive growth. Um, one of the other things with VLS is that it's very sensitive to environmental thresholds. Okay, and this is just two um, images of the same fire in different stages, showing you the effect that the uh, the aspect of the the terrain has on the development of the fire or the behaviour of the fire. So over here we have on the left we have winds from the north northwest. If we're looking at this pit of the landscape here, which is approximately east facing. You can see under the nor westerly winds, it's not doing much. You've just got the, the white sort of wispy smoke coming from it. However, later in the day, as the winds sort of veered around towards the west, this became sufficiently lee facing. And now you can see it sort of blowing up there. Okay, so just by shifting the wind direction, um, we can have very different 
different modes of fire behavior going on. All right, so just to point out that, you know, you see this effects, all these sorts of effects in some pretty notable fires. So this is the, the rim fire, which I would assume most people have heard of. And the thing that you, that's interesting about this picture is despite the fact that you've got, you know, the same broad scale atmospheric conditions going on, what you can see is you've got very distinct centers of pyroconvection. Okay, and if you look at where these distinct centers of pyroconvection are, you can link them back to bits of the terrain where, you know, despite the fact that the wind was kind of pushing up the page like that, the fire had sort of done these lateral excursions. And again, if you check the what the terrain is like, this is this is a pretty clear uh, candidate of a vorticity driven lateral spread. Okay, so again, it's this this local scale wildfire dynamics which is which is driving these sorts of events or driving the the, the centres of pyroconvection. Um, there's also some pretty strong implications for, for vorticity driven driven lateral spread around firefighter safety. Okay, I've got the, the South Canyon fire here again. And actually, when you look at this after you know a little bit, little bit about VLS, this little bit of the advancing flank here with all the dark cauliflower-like smoke coming off it is pretty distinctive of VLS. So there's a chance there that you know, this, this whole event was, was uh, influenced by VLS. Um, this is a fire in Montana uh, near Bozeman um, back in 2020. Um, where again the fire came over the top here and you can see the wind direction but the fires actually spread across this ridge and the firefighters were trapped down here fortunately none of them none of them were killed this time okay but there are some pretty uh, serious implications for firefighter safety attached to these sorts of behaviors as well um probably won't have time to go into this in too much detail but this was a study we did back in about 2015 and I was looking at a, a particular fire which burned in this, this sort of very rugged topography known as the Gross Valley, which is part of the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. Um, so there's the, the area it was burning. Um, for the first week of the fire, it spread pretty much as a standard fire front. Okay, you can see the, the front of the fire here, um, various places. Again, there's, um, yeah, this is the 21st, this is the 22nd, again. Frontal fire behavior going on here with um, you know, burnt stuff behind it. On the 22nd, though, in the afternoon, the, the weather got a little bit more serious, and um, you went from that at 11:20 to this at um, just before 2 p.m. So the things to point out in this this scan here is you've got this um, area of the fire here, which is developed laterally. Okay, you can see the the saturated uh, sensor there showing our lateral spread event. And actually most of this red shading here indicates um, regions of strong convective return in, in the radar. So strong um, yeah, convection going on there. And also the other area of interest is this um, bit where it's basically gone down the valley as a mass spotting event pretty rapidly. Fast forward a little bit later on in the day, this part of the fire has gone back to your ordinary frontal sort of behavior, but now you've got this bit of the fire arcing up, um, another lateral spread event. You can see it's moved across here, spotted down into the valley, and now this is where you're getting your strong radar returns. So we've got this spatial connection between our strong pyroconvection and where this fire is doing these, these weird sort of things. But if you think about that first one as event one and the second one as event two, okay, event one and event two there, then you can actually look at these on a time series of the plume height, okay, coming from the radar, the echo top height, and event one and event two are temporarily associated with these maximum um, plume heights, okay, where the, the fire actually got up and, and hit the tropopores, or the plume got up and hit the tropopores. Okay, and there's a, a picture at about two o'clock, which was 20 minutes after our first event. Okay, so there's this spatio-temporal link between these, these instances of dynamic fire behavior and these um, large plume events. So just to finish up, this really gives us a bit of an idea of, of how we might think about trying to predict these, these sorts of wildfires, or at least a conceptual framework. Um, the idea of this picture is to basically look at a situation on a given day and say, well, do we have an uncontrolled fire burning in a, in a, in a landscape 
under elevated fire danger. Okay, and this probably means something like, you know, very high in the Australian system. If we don't, then no problem. If we do, then the next question we really need to be thinking about is do we have a mechanism for deep flaming in that, in that landscape? Okay, are the winds strong enough? Are we expecting a wind change? Most importantly is, are we in rugged terrain prone to things like vorticity driven lateral spread? Is the fuel moisture um, content critically low so that it's gonna support mass spotting? Okay, if no, then it's probably nothing too much to worry about. We can sort of wait to the next hour and reassess. If yes, then we need to think about what's the atmosphere doing, okay? Do we have the sea haze high enough, for example? Again, if not, then nothing too much to worry about, perhaps. We can reassess an hour later, but if yes, then we can probably start to think about the likelihood of, of getting extreme wildfire forming. Okay, so just to finish up, I think the main points I want, wanted to sort of convey were um, when it comes to extreme wildfires, the traditional prediction tools, particularly geared around atmospheric um, properties, are kind of limited to in their ability to predict these, these, sorts, of, uh, these sorts of events and their behaviour. We really need to think about these things as coupled fire atmosphere events. Okay, so recognizing that the roles that the fire and the atmosphere play uh, individually, but also in combination, and the combination one is, is the, the harder part. Understanding dynamic fire behavior is critical because it seems to play this critical role in forming deep flaming. Okay, and I'm not aware of too many big fires that have blown up without some um, association with deep flaming. And of course, you know, this is a, this is a hard problem. We haven't we haven't solved it. Um, we really need to think about how these different aspects of the fire behavior of the extreme wildfire problem go together. All right, so I think that's all I really wanted to say. So thanks for listening, and hopefully people got something out of that. Thanks, Jason. That was uh, that was like super fascinating for me uh, because you know our group has often on discussed a lot of this, these same topics, right? And uh, have our own hypotheses. And it's amazing how many, you know, we have a lot of overlap in our in our theories with what you've presented. But you know, one of the things that comes up and has come up time and time again in our group is the role of the fuels, right? So you mentioned that you never saw any of these um, extreme, you know, uh, weather events or extreme fire behavior events um, in grass fuels, right? And so, you know, we, we think, in our group, we've been talking about the role of the like the heavy uh, down woody debris and how that uh, influences these things, right? This is, you know, we're also coming from the west coast of you know, the U.S. where we have the our you know history of fire exclusions, so we have a lot more fuel accumulation. So, you know, we have a you know, this um, is becoming very you know on our minds, and uh, and so we've you know been doing some reading and some research and and going back and looking at some of the mass fire literature from. Um, that came out after World War II, right after all those bombing raids and stuff. And, you know, the, the link between the, the long burning duration fuels makes sense to what you're saying with this, you need that like widespread flaming zone. I mean, is this something that you guys have, you know, included in your, th in your thinking or is it less relevant for Australia? You just, you just don't have the, the history of fire that we have or lack thereof. No, I mean, I, I should, should point out that you're, the review that you and Mark wrote, wrote on mass fires is, I think, one of the seminal papers in this area. So, thank you for that to begin with. Um, Thanks for that. So, what what we've um, what we've done in, in that in in that sort of um, area is a few years ago we 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 did some. I mean, well, most of it's been idealized modeling. I have to point out from from the outset. What we did was. Um, Back in about 2015, 2016, Colin Simpson, who was working for me, did a whole bunch of simulations using more fire. And he he basically went through the different third, the, the 13 different fuel categories that supported in, in more fire. So what he found was heavy logging slash was the most um, you know, readily able to, to produce the lateral spread. We didn't see it in grass. Mm. Okay, now that kind of makes sense because your grass is very flashy. It puts out a lot of heat, but it does it very quickly. And the plume dissipates very quickly because you have a very thin burning zone. Um, so, and you know, likewise in the events, when we look at the line scans that we have available in Australia, you often see these big yellow blobs 
where you've got sort of active flame indicated. And I think there's there's more recent work by by Dave Peterson's group, which is also um, sort of starting to show that you know these big pyrus EV pulses are more associated with, with rapid aerial growth of your fire. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense to me. I mean, just like you know, I, I get very uncomfortable because I'm not a not really an atmospheric scientist. I'm a mathematician who sort of lost his way. Um, but for me, it just seems sensible that if you've got a big chunky plume and you think about the way that plume dilutes or mixes with the surrounding atmosphere, it's all the stuff at the edge which gets teased away you know, more rapidly. So if you've got a very thin plume coming from a fire front, which is more like a, a sheet, it's a lot easier for the atmosphere to sort of break that apart, mix it around. If you've got a big chunky plume, all the stuff at the edge is being eaten away, but you've sort of got this sort of you know, quasi isolated core of hot, moist gas, which is able to rise higher and therefore is more likely to get to the, you know, the, the level of um, where condensation occurs, where you get extra latent heating, so on and so forth. So that's, that's, that's kind of the, I guess, the intuitive thoughts behind it. But I think, you know, particularly with some of the stuff that Dave Peterson's doing, we're going to be seeing a lot more um, support for that hypothesis. Right. I'm, I'm very anxious for that as well, because, you know, some of the, the other lab experiments that we dabbled with was just to kind of do a very simple, like, mimicking of this kind of process, right, and just simply put a little bit of a fuel under a chimney to kind of essentially block that, you know, entrainment of air to see what happens. Yes. Fuel under yep. And it can just launch. I mean, burning yep. rates of that stuff could just go double, triple what it was without the chimney. Yep. So there's definitely got to be this feedback and understanding how that, you know, how those things form, when does that plume, when do those uh, you know, criteria are, are, are met that causes this feedback that then turns it into this big nasty thing. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, and, and the challenge we face is that, you know, the nature of these events, you know, the real events out in the landscape are almost getting to the point where they're beyond science. I mean, you you can't go in there and, and measure these things in a repeatable repeatable way. So you are just left to, you know, try and mimic these you know, certain aspects of it through, you know, through smaller scale experiments, through idealized modeling and so on. And I think, you know, the more that you sort of do those sorts of things and, and sort of you know, try and pick out different aspects of, of the problem, the more you can then start to build up a picture of, of what's likely to be going on inside one of these big events. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we definitely should talk more. <laughs> I agree. So that that's a great lead, lead into the question that Sam typed in the question in the in the chat box. He asks, if provided unlimited resources, what research would you undertake to provide better understanding for these events? What's the first step? Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Um, I look, I think there really needs to be much stronger international collaboration across this area i mean these these events are happening all over the world um you know the 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 bridge of foothills fire which i showed there um you know that was ultimately something i i blame myself for if i had have sort of gone out and communicated this more this stuff more widely about the lateral spread you know perhaps they wouldn't have put firefighters there in the in the first place so i think you know just in terms of firefighter safety and community and, and you know, community safety, actually just trying to get a better appreciation for these sorts of dynamic fire behaviors and what they mean for the overall development of a fire is something that we 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 should be doing post haste. Okay, so that's kind of the, the first thing in terms of the that's that's more of a, a public firefighter safety issue. In terms of the science, I think you know as I said before, these these events are kind of on the fringe of science in a sense. Um, when these events happen, they are our experiments, okay? So we really need to be, you know, extracting as much information as possible from each event, okay? And, and every event that we don't do that is really an opportunity lost. Um, so really trying to think about how we can have all the information which is gonna be relevant for an event when it happens and resources on hand to go and um, you know, monitor that event you know, whether that be flying, you know, rugged, ruggedized drones or something through the plume or, or whatever, I'm not sure. 
Um, but yeah, it's something we re we really need to I, I, you know, think about and, and coordinate from you know, an international perspective more and you know, don't miss these opportunities when they occur. Unfortunately, it looks like they're going to occur more often, but um, we should we should try and you know, milk them for all they're worth. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, and the challenge of you know being there at the right place at the right time, you know, with your equip equipment, right? Because these are these are fires that you get out of the way of, right? These aren't the ones that you're you know trying to get out in front of and try to put some sensors in. These are you you just got to stand back and you know let them do their thing and being yeah. able to get measurements on it is yeah and very challenging so yeah and i think yeah a lot of the the work we've been doing lately is is what i would describe as bushfire triage so it's sort of looking at the situation you have where you may have you know 100 fires burning across your landscape and just saying okay out of those 100 fires which ones are the most likely to to turn into these one of these monsters and, and at least that gives you a little bit more of a you know a means of focusing your your resources right well and luckily it sounds like now with the stuff that you've done you kind of at least narrowed it down a little bit <laughs> into some of the conditions that you know we need to look yeah for. it's uh, well we're, we're doing better than we were 10 years ago i think yeah like yeah. awesome well i don't see any other questions and we're coming right about up on time so um, unless anybody, you know, unmutes and asks anything or types anything in the chat box, we'll, uh, you know, say adieu. And um, just a reminder that um, January is our student webinar where we're going to have uh, three different students. Um, so, yes, please tune in for those talks. Um, the information will be posted uh, shortly. It looks like the IFSS website's been down, but we'll get those emails out. Um, but, yeah, thanks again, Jason, for wonderful talk and you and I need to you know communicate some more on this topic for sure we should visit each other when they when things actually open up agreed I would very much like that <laughs> all right well thanks Marty thanks again <laughs>